Hello and welcome to the Global Dialogue Series at Global Studies. My name is Jisha Menon and I'm the Fisher Family Director of Stanford Global Studies. Before we get started, I'd like to thank our team behind the scenes, Christine Jeong, Stephanie Pitkiewicz, Julie Tatsukawa, Simrat Mathru, Kristen Hara, and Kate Kuhns. Thank you all for joining us. We're thrilled to see people across the globe join us for these panel discussions, and we're excited to convene Global Dialogues again as we focus on our theme of global connections. This panel discussion could not be more timely as we recover from the atmospheric rivers that tore across um, my home state in California over these past few weeks. And today we have a panel of brilliant scholars discussing water politics in a global context, offering insights on momentous incidents such as the devastating floods in Pakistan this past year, but also on more insidious entanglements of water politics with um, technocracy and governmentality and bureaucracy. Uh, to kick things off, let me introduce our a uh, moderator for this event, my wonderful colleague, Andrew Bauer, who has kindly agreed to serve in this capacity. Professor Bauer is an anthropological archeologist whose research focuses on the archeology span of human environment relations, including the sociopolitics of land use and both symbolic and material aspects of producing spaces, places, and landscapes. His primary research is based in South India, where he investigates the relationships between landscape history, cultural practices, and institutionalized forms of social inequalities and difference in the Neolithic, Iron Age, early historic, and medieval periods. He also studies the intersections of landscape histories and modern framings of nature that relate to conservation politics and climate change. His most recent publication is Climate Without Nature, a critical anthropology of the Anthropocene. Please find a longer introduction to the wide ranging and impactful scholarship of Professor Bauer in the link that we'll post in the chat function. And now I'll turn things over to Andrew. Thank you so much, Jisha. It's a pleasure to be here today and a pleasure to be moderating this conversation. And I have the um, distinct honor of introducing our esteemed panelists. So I'm gonna start with Dr. Andrea Balestero who is Associate Professor of Anthropology at the University of Southern California. She's also Director of the, Ethnograph the Ethnography Studio. Her book, A Future History of Water, which was published by Duke University Press in 2019, examines how people create a difference between water as a human right and water as a commodity in Costa Rica and Brazil. Dr. Ballestero is currently writing a book that explores cultural imaginaries of the underground, as a planetary frontier. Based in Costa Rica, the book shows how the emergence of aquifers into the public's, how aquifers into the public sphere is expanding the social worlds downward into subterranean space. So thank you for being here, Andrea. It's a pleasure to have you and welcome. Um, our, our second panelist, Lucas Basir, is a professor of anthropology at the University of Oklahoma. His research interests include natural resources, inequality, affect, and genre. He has held fellowships at the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton and Harvard's Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study. He's the author of Behold the Black Cayman, a Chronicle of Aorio Life, um, published by the University of Chicago Press in 2014. And he's the co-editor of Radio Fields, Anthropology and Wireless Sound in the 21st Century, which came out with NYU Press in 2012. Most recently, he's written Running Out in Search of Water on the High Plains, published by Princeton University Press in 2021. Running Out was awarded five book prize prizes and selected as a finalist for the National Book Award. Professor Basir is currently working on environmental and economic histories of the Arctic and High Plains. Uh, welcome, Lucas. Thank you for being here. And, and last but certainly not least, um, Dr. Myra Hyatt is an assistant professor of environment and peace studies at the University of Notre Dame and is concurrently a member in the a member of the faculty in the Department of Anthropology as well. She's currently at the Institute for Advanced Studies in Princeton. Dr. Hyatt conducts research at the intersections of bureaucracy, law, and the environment, drawing on ethnographic and archival methods in Pakistan and increasingly also in the U.S. Her current and first, and first book project, Duties of Water, Bureaucratic Labor, and the Postcolonial Promise, 
is based on her doctoral research, which won the 2019 SS Prasada Annual Dissertation Prize for Best Dissertation on Pakistan. A chapter titled The Gender of Corruption, Bureaucrats, Bodies, and the Female Complaint won the Association of Feminist Anthropology's 2018 Sylvia Foreman Prize. Okay. Welcome, Myra, um, and thank you for being here. It's, it's my pleasure to have the um, have the, the the privilege to facilitate this conversation and to moderate it today. And just to a note for our audience, um, you all should have ex access to the Q&A function at the bottom of your screens on the Zoom platform. And so we, of course, ask you and encourage you to ask questions and to submit questions for our panelists today. Um, we should, I, I think, towards the second half of the hour, be able to turn to those questions. Um, but I, I will go ahead and get us get us started um, with uh, questions for the three three panelists to discuss. So my my first question, just thinking about um, your work collectively, um, is is to think about water and the ways in which we might know it through technical mediation. So I'm just going to read a prompt here and ask you all to respond. So to know water resources often require specific forms of technical mediation, right? Experts, measuring devices, aggregation of large data sets that um, are of course unequally accessible to a lot of water users and consumers. So I'm wondering how you see tensions, if at all, in your research between the need for experts that are charged with rendering water legible to institutions of governance and situated place-based knowledges or place-based epistemologies. And, and I'm, I'm curious how you know, these tensions actually challenge programs to achieve concerns for environmental justice with respect to water and water use. Um, so that's uh, maybe a first question that we can start with to get this conversation going. And Andrea, can I, can I ask you to speak first? Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Andrew. And first of all, thank you so much to Jisha and to the team at Global Studies. It's, it's really wonderful to be here and uh, particularly lovely to be here with Myra and Lucas, people whose work I, I've read for a while and I have the privilege to know personally and really like his people as well, which is the best combination possible. Um, so thank you for a really, uh, I think, important question, uh, Andrew, that you're posing. And uh, maybe I'll focus for this part of the conversation a little bit on, on how we conceive of tensions. And uh, in my work, it has been uh, really crucial uh, to keep in mind that those forms of knowledge that we could contrapose to place-based forms of knowledge are also place-based and are also historical and uh, come from very specific contexts and, and have the, uh, concrete genealogies that travel through space and time. And so more concre concretely, what that means is that for me in my work, when I have looked at, for instance, the way in which people use a formula to set the price of water or to calculate infiltration rates, those formulas uh, and the ways in which they're activated by particular technocrats, bureaucrats, or scientists in Costa Rica have histories as well and have certain presumptions of place embedded in them. Um, and so to in, a, in, another, in other words, to think about this tension as a tension between forms of place-based knowledge rather than some forms coming from a particular context and others being uh, solely universalized or abstract. And by this, I don't mean to suggest that they are equal. Uh, it's evident that they have different affordances, that they have different institutional backings in terms of the kind of support for certain forms of knowledge to circulate and become dominant or not. Uh, but this move of thinking of all of these as coming from place and history, uh, from my point of view, has uh, the effect of demystifying in a certain way the privilege that often uh, technocratic forms of knowledge, technical forms of knowledge, scientific forms of knowledge are, are given. Um, so that's one uh, one angle to the question. And the second one that I wanted to emphasize is that if we think about place-based versus technocratic, scientific, or knowledge that claims um, universality, even within this second category, there are multiple forms of knowledge, and there are some that are privileged over others. 
uh, to make this concrete, if you think about uh, the idea of a water budget, for instance, which is one of those things that travels and, are, and people put a lot of uh, work and effort into developing uh, for making decision, decisions, that kind of quantified knowledge has a different kind of privilege or affordances from a historical, a historical account of water accessibility, for instance. And we can think about both of those as coming as being forms of technical expertise and even as being forms of colonial knowledge in certain uh, configurations. And yet even within that category, there is um, this multiplicity. So um, I guess to bring it together, what, what I wanted to put on the table is that maybe it's important to sometimes multiply the tensions uh, in the sense that we can recognize that all forms of knowledge are place-based and also that those forms of knowledge that are in the scientific universalist abstract category uh, are also diverse within uh, that space. And the moment in which we multiply the tensions in a certain way, I feel uh, that we can find points of intervention uh, more easily uh, when we remain aware of the uh, multiplicity of these forms of knowledge, the different affordances that they carry, and uh, you know, leave behind the fundamental contrast between something that is place-based and something that is, that is not. Um, so I'll put that on the table maybe to get us going and I'll hand it off to Lucas maybe to see if, what thoughts you have in regards to this question. Lovely. Thank you so much, um, Andrea. And I'd like to join in um, thanking everybody here. Thank you, Jisha. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Myra. Thank you, Andrea. And thank you all the people who are participating and listening for taking time out of your day uh, to join this conversation. It's a real honor. Um, and I really appreciate this last prompt that Andrea put on the table about multiplying the tensions because um, definitely my work has a similar kind of um, marked presence of an epistemic tension and rift at the core of it. Uh, I, I get into that question in a kind of backwards way. Um, my project is an ethnography of extreme aquifer depletion in southwest Kansas, where I'm from, where five generations of my family have lived as farmers and ranchers, and where in many places where they live and have ranched for a long time, the groundwater is running out or has already run out. So. I got into this question about tensions not knowing anything. I never planned to write about this topic. I never planned to try to understand aquifers. Uh, I did a lot of work in Paraguay and Bolivia before, uh, and I was really just returning to the farm to reconnect with my father. Uh, and he's the one who started telling me about a dropping water table. It seemed like those concerns that he had with the topic were something we could share and try to reconnect around. Uh, and so that turned into a really long journey of us talking to different stakeholders and experts. And the farther we got, the more the tensions became apparent. Um, I learned about my family's role in this problem, which I didn't know. I learned about all the absences that were in my own historical consciousness. Uh, and that became a way into thinking about the epistemic disjunctures that were driving aquifer depletion in this particular place. So what we discovered, me and my father, because it was really a co-authored project, uh, is that there are certain myths that accrue around this extreme groundwater depletion in southwest Kansas. There are six of those myths that are the primary drivers. First myth is the nature of the aquifer itself, uh, and that resonates with a lot of work by many scholars, including Professor Ballestero, um, that, that aquifers are not a single thing. Uh, even though I grew up imagining them as kind of this underground river or lake that, that drops in a single uniform way, and it turns out that that's entirely not true at all. So there's an epistemic disjuncture there. There is um, an epistemic disjuncture around the figure of the farmer, which gets manufactured in a particular way in southwest Kansas uh, as, as if rural communities are solely to blame for being duped, short-sighted, conservative voters. Uh, and that's not true either. It turns out that farmers are an extremely diverse group, uh, that there's different positions within that group in relationship to aquifers, and there's a big distinction between corporate agribusiness farming 
uh, and family farmers in that particular region. And those, those are the two demographics that have really radically distinct relationships to the future of the aquifer. The third myth is that aquifer depletion, extreme aquifer depletion makes economic sense which in Southwest Kansas isn't true, but there's an entire apparatus that's mobilized around this ideology of the bottom line. Uh, it turns out that a lot of farmers actually lose money pumping out the last bits of groundwater, uh, which was stunning to me. I had no idea about this. The fourth myth is that groundwater governance is actually democratic. It turns out to not be true. Uh, so there's a kind of way in which those original four myths turn into a sense of inevitability that depletion is inevitable, it's a, it's a fifth myth, uh, and then therefore that the politics of blame is an appropriate response. And there's a technocratic expertise that's built into every single one of those myths, but it's not the, the only story. Uh, and I think that's what Andrea was bringing up, uh, that there's a kind of way in which the gap in between the different myths and actuality uh, is really important. Something important is happening there to drive the problem and to prevent a solution uh, from coming up in a way that people can really grasp or hold on to. So what you're talking about is a series of profound epistemic disconnects that then resonate as emotional disconnects too. Uh, and th that mirroring of the technical insufficiency with the narrative insufficiency with the existential um, incompleteness or open-endedness is something that I was really struck with. Uh, in my work. So I think that that's a place that uh, this conversation might also go. And I'd just like to add that piece to the table, uh, the piece about the emotional, um, the emotional legacies and affective disconnects that reflect, mirror, uh, and amplify the epistemic disconnects around something like extreme groundwater depletion in a place uh, like Southwest Kansas. Uh, and with that, I'll um, open the floor or pass the pass the baton to Myra. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so yes, I also want to start by thanking Jisha and Simrat, Christian and Julie for the invite and for organizing all of this. Um, Andrew, thank you for moderating and um, the honor and privilege is all mine to be on the same panel as Professors Ballester and this year, whose work I've been engaging for years now. Um, so I'll, I'll begin with a somewhat convoluted answer to your prompt, um, Andrew, through the, through the question of theft of water, but I think I need to outline the setting just a little bit, um, first. So I'm, I'm talking about, um, I'll be referring to, um, the irrigation network in Pakistan's Punjab province. So this is, um, the country's agricultural heartland. It's also its most populous province. And so really what's going on is from, you know, from these huge dams, the water's flowing through canals into a finer and finer network um, until it reaches the outlet. And this outlet is also known as the Moga. And through the Moga, through the outlet, an already determined, that is calculated, volume and flow of water passes um, through into waterways and then onto farmers' fields. And then how is this irrigation water distributed among cultivators after it passes through this outlet? Each outlet operates according to a vara bandi, right? And a vara bandi is the water rotation scheduled for irrigation water. Um, so in this measurement regime, area of land holding corresponds with time share of water. So the bigger your land holding, the greater your time share of water, which is known as a vari. Right? The time duration for each cultivator is proportional um, to the size of the cultivator's land holding. And then, so I'll spare you the details, but but. Basically, what's going on here is the 168 hours of the week are divided by the area of land holdings to be irrigated by an outlet. And so the entire area that an outlet is supposed to irrigate, um, the entire area under its command, is known as a chakbandi. Right? And during a cultivator's turn, which is, you know, the cultivator's vari, that cultivator alone has the right to use all the water flowing um, in the water course, right? That's how it's supposed to work. So the theft point I want to make is... a. Uh, you know, like when you when you when you think about theft, there's there's a secrecy to theft. Who is the thief? When does the theft happen? How, etc. Except in this context, it's all very well known. Everyone knows who's taking more than they are supposed to, when and how. There, in fact, um, there is in fact, and people say that there has to be collaboration between the experts 
um, you know, whether we understand them as bureaucrats, um, elite tiers, uh, lower tiers, and users. So, so there's near universal consensus that theft is only possible because of this collaboration. Some people in the water sector that I've met during my research call it robbery, not theft, because of you know, how openly it's being done. And so I'd say that in this one respect, the knowledge question doesn't seem to be blocking the justice question. Like lack of knowledge is not, um, is not getting in the way of anything. Everyone knows. Right? There's also a pervasive understanding of and sympathy for this sort of theft, right? So for example, I, I frequently heard irrigation officials say things like, well, of course there's theft, there's going to be because need is greater than supply. What do you think? What else can the farmer do? Um, but then a second and distinct as aspect of this knowing or not knowing tension, um, and in this case, it very much seems to me um, to be a tension is the variation I sometimes saw among water users regarding water rates, regarding their knowledge of what the water rates were. So this water rate is known as Abiana. It is a water charge. Really, it's a tax for using canal irrigation water. And in this case, what's going on is that there is uncertainty around what the going charge is at a particular time because these rates have changed on and off. And so in this uncertainty is, I think, lies the possibility to make illicit or you know, marginal gains corruption, if we may call it that, and also to shore up bureaucratic authority. And it's interesting to me that here this authority, or you may call it its perversion, is a function of knowing more, knowing definitively, and withholding updated knowledge, right? Um, then there's a third access. And here I want to zoom out from the outlet or the MOGA that I was talking about earlier. Um, and I, I think I want to say a little bit about this access in particular because it highlights the scaling work at play. And it might also respond to one of the points that Andrea was making about multiplying these tensions. So for example, Punjab is the upper riparian and the province of Sindh is downstream to Punjab. So among provincial bureaucratic elites, a point of contention has long been that Punjab is holding, taking, using, diverting more water than its share and not letting agree agreed upon flows you know, into Sindh. So this hostility, distrust, antagonism, and the politics around it, again, this is nothing new or unique to Pakistan. Right? This is a case, I think, in so many other places across national borders. Um, if you look at US-Mexico water sharing within national borders, look at India, right, for example, between Karnataka and Tamil Nadu, or between Haryana and Indian Punjab. And, but, but I also don't want to flatten the very real differences in histories that, you know, animate this tension. But, but, to, but to say that they are structured around having to share the water, right? So anyway, back to Punjab and Sindh. So one measure that was adopted to deal with this problem was the provincial governments decided to station an irrigation bureaucrat from Sindh at key barrages in Punjab to make sure that the agreed upon flows of water were being you know, recorded. And then um, the fourth and last dimension is, um, is this growing and increasingly public conversation around calculations of decreasing water availability and the infrastructural politics that they seem to be animating and pushing forward. So for example, one measure is the Falcon Mark Index, which is a per capita measure of water availability. So to know water and its depletion, uh, you know, figured here uh, in, this, in this campaign, uh, in this nationwide drive around three years ago in Pakistan to collect funds to build two new large dams um, in the country, right? And so again and again, what was cited as justification was look at this, look at this index, look at this index, it's, it's you know, decreasing. Of course, it's decreasing as populations. It's, it's, it's basically an average. It's a very, very simple, very crude average measure, right? Um, so the official discourse went something like, look, our water availability has decreased from X to Y. We must prepare for the future. How will we do this? We have to build storage today, right? And here too, there's an interesting and I think very important uh, urgent politics of global South sovereignty and insecurity that you know, needs to be understood, which I think inflects the environmental justice question in very interesting uh, and, and complicated ways. I don't mean interesting in a you know, good way, but also in like very, very, uh, I think complex ways, right? Because so officially leads in the campaigns for these dams in Pakistan, and um, to the best of my knowledge, also in Ethiopia's case with the Grand Renaissance Dam, this, they've, they've suggested a justice component to this infrastructure. And, it, and, and this is an external or geopolitical sort of justice, if you will. Um, especially, and I think this makes sense when you think of this infrastructure 
in light of the fact that transnational organizations like the World Bank have refused to fund them. Right? So for example, in Pakistan, one of the central anchors for this discussion was, we don't need to beg for money. We can do this ourselves. So let's, you know, we, we, we will crowdfund um, this massive infrastructure. Um, I recognize that all of this may come as pretty, uh, pretty dispersed, but I wanted to get at the, um, at the very different dynamics at play, depending on you know, where we're asking the question of knowing or not, um, or not knowing from. And I will, I will end there. Th thank you, Mara, and, and thanks also to um, Andrea and Lucas for your responses. Um, you know, something that you were just saying there, Myra, really, I think dovetails with a question that I also had, um, thinking about, you know, what you were mentioning there at the end in terms of infrastructural politics um, and the politics around water distribution in those terms. And, and I was just, you know, a, a question that I thought I might ask the group is really about water and water's materiality, right? I mean, in the sense that, you know, we water is, of course, primarily circulated and distributed as a fluid, right? Not, not a solid, right? And so that, that made me think about other kinds of techno politics around other resources that are also fluids. And so it got me thinking about, for instance, like oil and oil being underneath the ground, right? And also being distributed largely through you know, well, you know, being mined and distributed through like, you know, ducts and pipes and things like that. And and of course, there's a there's a literature and an argument about the kind of politics and the techno politics that go along with things like oil. Um, and I was wondering how we might think about water as having a unique kind of techno politics too, right? And the sense that it strikes me that it's very sort of, you know, with, with the case of oil, for instance, um, it's very, you know, capital intensive as opposed to labor intensive. And that enables different kinds of politics to its production and distribution. And I'm just wondering if we have, if there's, if there's some parallels there with water, or what the three of you might th think about the kind of materiality of water and it's the requisite infrastructure and and how that speaks to specific politics of water in the areas where you work. That was a bit that was a bit winding, but but hopefully that that's that's clear. Um, and. Um, I, you know, Myra, do you, I, it, I mean, it strikes me that the question dovetails with some of the things you were just saying. So I was wondering if you wanted to go ahead and just jump on that. Yes, sure. I'd be happy to, um, I'd be happy to respond with a winding answer. <laughs> so, um, so in some areas that I've, you know, worked in, what's going on is that the canals are lower than the land that they're supposed to water. Um, so what happens then? So, you know, in proceedings and irrigation offices, I often heard people complain, well, the water is not going to jump up to my land, right? So, so yes, I have an allocation. Yes, I have this uh, timeshare. What do I, how do I get it to my, to my land, right? So you install pumps, so you find out other ways and routes, so you lease your land because it's just too much of a bother trying to figure this out, or you, you know, install tube wells, right? You, there's, there's greater reliance around groundwater extraction. And as the water table is um, receding, um, it remains to be seen in you know, different areas, depending on the quality of groundwater and its appropriateness for agriculture. And I think here, you know, um, uh, Andrea and Lucas are probably better suited to speak to this. Um, I think it, it remains to be seen in different areas, whether and how canal water distribution is going to come under greater stress or not, because it's, it's not a simple or an easy switch. What sort of exit from this uh, network will result? What sorts of adjustments to it will become uh, you know, uh, prevalent? Then there's a small point also about the flow of water that that it flows means that it also evaporates. Um, and that has led to, for example, you know, multiple programs, including massive donor funded ones to better line canals and prevent leakage which then runs into the associated question of, well, what about aquifer recharge? If you want to stop all leakage, um, what about, you know, what, what, what about um, recharge? Um, and, and, and then like, if I were to, you know, travel with this water upstream, I think distinct material dimensions are revealed, right? So for example, canal water, as I was saying earlier, in this case, I mean, to flow, it has to be stored in huge dams um, upstream, right? Because we're not talking about um, consistent rainfall throughout the year. It's concentrated in a few months um, of the year, right? And there's a very contentious and also very old, uh, which is not to say tired, 
uh, but 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 an old politics around this massive infrastructure in Pakistan. Right? So around the lands and livelihoods and homes that have been drowned to make way for this infrastructure. So the largest are um, the Mangla and the Tarbila dams in Pakistan's north. And uh, for example, if you you know consider just the Tarbila at the time that it was built in the 1970s, it was the world's largest earth-filled dam. And this infrastructure was built as part of a water sharing treaty between India and Pakistan, which is the you know, Indus Water Treaty. And the treaty was meant to separate the two countries' water use. So it was a bordering practice um, in a way. And Pakistan was given compensation for river water that for, uh, flowing in rivers that were now India's rivers through this you know, massive infrastructure to read out water. And hence you have this vast lattice of um, you know, link canals which make the water go in every uh, you know, which direction. And, uh, and, and really what we're talking about is it, it's also been called an unprecedented feat of earth moving. So we're looking at something like the excavation of 7 billion cubic yards of earth. I mean, I don't even know what that means, that number. This was part of a $2 billion project, which I think in today's terms is something like $17 billion. This entailed, you know, as I was saying, construction of dams, barrages, and over 400 miles of link canals in the Indus Basin. So there's a Cold War era politics of these dams. Um, but it's not just that politics, right? There, there, there's politics around these dams too. And, and this includes litigation, which is, which is actually still ongoing in courts in Pakistan. People contesting claims of displacement um, and the terms of compensation, et cetera. And I will end um, uh, you know, with, with what, I, what I see as increasingly what I see as, as one perhaps fantasy of resource management, which is um, no people. So water management with meters or what have you, but without these inept, corrupt bureaucrats. Um, as one example, where I've been working in the offices in which I've been working, water billing is now being digitized. Right? So this too is producing a whole politics of development, aid and investment. It's rearranging bureaucrat relations with the employer, i.e. the state. It's threatening older arrangements of labor and its recompense. And given that these are all processes underway, it remains to be seen what new arrangements will take shape and solidify um, or unravel. And I wanted to end you know, uh, with this last bit because I think your question powerfully raises another underlying question that I've long thought about. Um, what do we understand the materiality of water to be? Are the bureaucracies that manage it, are they, are they a part of this materiality? The legislation under which it is distributed, it, you know, is, is that a part two? How enlarged or confined are our understandings of water's materiality and, and um, to what effects? Um, and maybe I can uh, now ask Lucas um, to weigh in. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Myra. That, it's lovely to hear about your work. It's so important. Uh, and I appreciate that prompt that you left because I think that in the case of Southwest Kansas, at least, the objective materialities, however that's defined, and the subjective materialities or the cultural imaginaries of the materiality and the politics that are mobilized around those don't necessarily connect. And something really important happens in the gaps between those different dimensions or modalities of materiality that has to do directly with access and these questions of justice that you know, Andrew, you so rightly brought up earlier. So in Southwest Kansas, you know, you're talking about a heavily agricultural place where 98% of the water is used for industrial agriculture. A very small minority of farmers control nearly all of that use. But these are really aquifer societies, our rural communities, including the one I'm from. Everything in those places depends on aquifer water somehow. Uh, and that's from school budgets to hospital budgets to mortgages to loans to the future financial arrangements on, on payments. Uh, and it's a real um, democratic good that then gets governed in a very anti-democratic way because the groundwater management districts are an intermediary political formation built around groundwater. And in that in those contexts, only people who own 40 acres of land or control water rights to one acre foot of water per year can vote and participate, which means you have a situation in which something like, you know, one to 2% of the population controls the resource on which everybody depends. Uh, and 
within that, there's fundamental exclusions of racial um, divisions, of class divisions, of gender divisions. Uh, and you can see that that mechanism in turn is premised on this disconnect between the objective and the subjective dimensions of materiality of groundwater. So how does that really happen or how can you think about that? Well, there's a couple of ways into that question. Um, and I don't want to go too far or get too abstract here, so I'll keep it uh, as tight as I can. Um, but first of all, you have this contested materiality of the aquifer in collective consciousness, where people are still trying to figure out things like how unevenly does groundwater run out in southwest Kansas? What actually fits within pro private property borders and regimes or not? That's an open question. It's being contested and debated. What are the units of groundwater? How are they actually being measured? How are they being contested? How can we work with them or not? Those things are still open ended. That insecurity or uncertainty then turns into a transference between this subterranean imaginary into an infrastructure of extraction that's already constrained and exclusive. That materiality is, is channeled and restricted already by the time it moves from the subterranean imaginary to uh, a conveyance. And then once the water gets to the surface, it has a different materiality or a different um, disjuncture around its materialities. Uh, and when it's on the surface, it's intelligible not as this profoundly potent cultural, social, emotional stuff, not as a connective tissue between present economic ideologies and historical consciousness and the gaps between them, that structure of belonging or aphasia or dispossession or whatever, but instead it's only intelligible as an input into a commodity production cycle. So it's cordoned off. Uh, it's reserved for agribusiness in an ethical and moral way. It's abstracted from historical and social relationships and it's dramatically undervalued in a very particular and strange and striking way to me. Uh, and it's dramatically undervalued um, because of the ways that the temporalities of profit work in that particular system. Uh, there's a bracketing of costs, there's a bracketing uh, of gain, uh, and there's a transference to the future that happens through that bracketing. So um, those are the ways in which the materiality of groundwater in Southwest Kansas comes back to a kind of technopolitics of access. Uh, and again, I, I just really appreciate the prompt from Myra uh, to expand the question about what is materiality? What are the boundaries? What are the modes? Uh, and how do the, the disconnects between those different modes uh, structure the kind of inequities of access? I also think, uh, just to put one other piece on the table here, um, the question about um, the materialities of our concept work the materialities of our theorizations are also a really um, interesting thing to me. I'm trying to think about the way that genre turns so easily into materiality in these contexts. Um, and I think that um, maybe I could just put that on the table for continued uh, discussion or, or conversation. And with that, pass it to um, Andrea. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, I love this conversation, and and thank you, Myra, for uh, putting pressure on the on the issue of what we understand as as the material or materiality. And you know, wish Andrew was part of the of the panel so that he could put his his own piece as as an anthropological archaeologist here. Uh, but for me, what has been really helpful in approaching the question of materiality has been thinking laterally. Uh, I've done work in Northeast Brazil, in the state of Serra, and in Costa Rica, where I'm from. Um, and the, the weight, the political and technical weight of the materiality of water is different in those two locations. So I'll, I'll say a little bit about that. So we have on the one hand, the case of Serra in Northeast Brazil, which is a semi-arid region, um, a, a state that has historically experimented with different water sector reforms and water management uh, schemes. Very early on, implemented participatory systems to allocate water from reservoirs and so on and so forth. Uh, and they, there they have, of course, 
all of the material challenges of moving waters through semi-arid semi -arid areas. You know, the challenges in piping, but also in terms of evaporation that Myra mentioned. So moving water in that kind of context has historically been much more complicated than moving something like electricity, which is, of course, if we're thinking from the point of view of the household or even from the point of view of, of production, uh, the, the other uh, public service uh, that is critical uh, in the configuration of, of social life. So in the in the Sertão or in the hinterlands uh, in Brazil, uh, people, many people had electricity much earlier than they ever had uh, water in their households. And at the same time, the politics of irrigation and the politics of agriculture and the movement of certain people from rain-fed agricultural systems to irrigated systems that were created and controlled by the state gave the materiality of water its own political charge. Um, and of course, also we have here a long history of building great reservoirs or great dams, these massive infrastructures connecting uh, the state to San Francisco uh, River, which is one of the biggest rivers in Brazil. And so the idea of moving water from far away all the way uh, into Serra because of, of the limited amounts of water uh, that they have in the area. Now let's think about another case. Uh, let's think about the case of Costa Rica, uh, where things are a little bit different. Uh, its water regime is one of a tropical area, even though despite the fact that it's a very, very small country, uh, you have very distinct climatic regimes on the Caribbean versus Pacific coast and in the central uh, valley. Nevertheless, overall, we can imagine this as a tropical area that gets um, uh, a good amount of rainfall uh, during the year. And here, the, the difficulty or the challenge of the materiality uh, is a little bit different. During the 20th century, there were huge investments uh, on the part of the state to uh, create public utilities uh, of the era, right? With the develop developmentalist state that were, was uh, designed to provide service to, this, to, to the population. Uh, but at the same time, what they invested in and um, was a very vast system of community aqueduct organizations that up to the present uh, supply water to 35% of the population. And these are really, uh, for a long time, these were really grounded organizations uh, on uh, that actually were the ones not only managing the infrastructure, but at the moments when there were charges, they were the ones collecting uh, the fees that people had to pay. They were the ones that for a long time were doing this work on a voluntary basis. So it was not a, a, a labor relation. It was people that volunteered to do the work of maintenance and the work of organizing this. Uh, um, the administrative part of having the aqueducts uh, running. So you see this, is, but because of the availability of water, what you see is that the materiality of water is embraced and managed by this diversity of actors with very different technical challenges in terms of moving the water. There was no need to move water through very, very long distances because you could usually find a source nearby. And so, the significance of the challenge, uh, what, I'm what I'm suggesting with these two examples, is that the significance of the challenge of the materiality is always grounded. Uh, it's always place specific. And I, I would stop short of, of, or I would avoid uh, making a, um, a diagnostic uh, assessment of its difficulty. Um, or I should say of the difficulty of moving water, for instance, because of these different uh, environmental conditions. And um, I I'll get to a point, or maybe I'll say this now. I think for a long time, the, the conversation around water has been dominated by the question of uh, sufficiency or the question of where there is, whether there is enough quantity of water. And uh, as Maida knows very well, I think that something that is starting to take a lot of our attention is the question of access as well. Not necessarily of usable water, drinkable water, potable water, but the magnitude 
of the floods that different parts of the world are, are experiencing through different cycles is now creating a whole different challenge in relation to the materiality of water that is not limited to the question of whether we have, it, we have enough or not for human consumption uh, or human use. And maybe if I can put a, a last uh, issue on the table is the, the, the idea that, the, that we need to think about the materiality of water uh, also in more than human terms, right? So what, how is it that something like movement or the flow of water that is essential to ecosystems becomes part of our uh, of the elements that are on the table anytime that we have this conversation about whether we can or should move water from one location uh, to another. And so, you know, if you look at the at the history of people that have been concerned with this, you know, not only um, physical responses to this have been happening for a while. Uh, many parts around the world where people are removing dams to allow water to move again, but also technically concepts such as flow uh, or the minimum sustainable flow and how that comes to figure in different political uh, intervention. And so in this, in, in this, in relation to this last point about how to think about the materiality of water in relation to more than human uh, questions, one thing that has been really generative for me was to move from the substance itself into uh, the things that the substance does, to put it in these terms. And so what would happen, for instance, if we thought about the materiality of water from the point of view of movement from the get-go, rather than from the point of view of where it ends, and how the question of movement might bring uh, to our attention uh, of course, human human needs, but also the ecosystemic questions that are at stake uh, at this point in time. Um, and maybe all that, I'll I'll return it to to Andrew. Thank you, thank you so much, Andrea. That was um, that was that was really um, a really powerful response. I thought, and also thinking about you know going beyond the human in some senses and thinking about. Right, the way that we talk about materials and what materials do, right, and how they actually relationally do things, as it were, right, and keeping that in focus, and and I guess what I would, you know, we're we're getting to the point where we're going to open the conversation up to questions from the audience, um, and and so I guess maybe as one final question before we do that, I, I see some questions are starting to come in, so if you have uh, a question or a thought, please put it at use the Q and A function so that we can address the panelists, the the panel with them. Um, but I will just, I, I think, piggyback on something Andrea just just was was alluding to, um, and and I'll just ask, I, I think, a, one final question for the group, um, which is just this question about you know excess and too much water, and something that Jisha mentioned in the opening, right? about atmospheric rivers, for instance, here in California, right? And so I'm just wondering, you know, how how does, you know, climate change, anthropogenic global warming, more extreme weather, weather, right? And and generally warmer and wetter in some contexts, right? Um, I mean, how how does cl human related climate change um, impact the politics of water in the areas that you all work? I mean, are there discourses of climate change that do actually articulate with access to water, too much water, that kind of thing. If maybe you could address that, um, then we can go ahead and open it up to the to the to the audience. Does anyone want to go first on that? No. I guess to I I, I was late. Uh, so I'll, I'll I'll be the yes. Uh, well, I come from Costa Rica. And the conversation around climate change has been there for a really long time. I remember when I was just out of uh, high school, as out of uh, college, I should say, and you know, finding my way professionally, what is it that I wanted to do? And one of the things that we, one of the concepts that was organized in our work was global change, which meant global warming and changes in migration patterns. And we really were hoping to keep those two together uh, just anecdotally uh, to get to the to the point that in Costa Rica the question of climate change has been there for a really long time uh, in all sorts of ways 
people that, you know, the experts that we were talking about before uh, that are very active, not only uh, in terms of positioning the topic in Costa Rica, but also internationally in having these, these conversations, um, but also in terms of responses internally. So creation of more reservoirs, for instance, right now there's a big project that is going to the large reservoir uh, methodology uh, of addressing climate change. At the same time, this is on the, on the Pacific side, the drier side of Costa Rica, at the same time that there's a collaboration with Peruvian experts who are teaching um, farmers uh, in this part of the country, uh, what they call ancestral Inca techniques of water storage. And so they're drawing on the, the ways in which these smaller reservoirs uh, were built or are built in, in Peru and teaching farmers over there. So you see that you have the whole, the whole spectrum. Uh, of, of responses. Um, in relation to water, I would say that there's, it's a, it's a permanent, um, it's an um, atmospheric uh, mood, if I can say it this way. So in the sense that people have the references, reference available, and by people I mean both scientists, government officials, but also organized communities. Um, how that translates into specific actions is still something that we're all figuring out. Uh, and um, you know, I can give a couple of examples. One, one of those is uh, this turn to aquifers, which were not a political object of attention you know, up to the 80s. It was a specialized mm -hmm. topic that a few people in the government or scientists or farmers dealt with. Now, many, many more people are having this conversation and uh, citizens are being invited to, to change the way in which they think about the, uh, the subsurface and particularly about the role of aquifers in their daily life. Um, but also, uh, and with this I will end, Costa Rica is also subject to the political swings and political, uh, and sorry, populist maneuvers that we're seeing all over the world. So we have now uh, a turn towards what for many of us is a much more conservative damaging uh, orientation towards the environment, if we want to use that term, um, that is actually putting into question, why should we care about climate change? What we need is to think about economic growth, what we need is to think about X, Y, and Z. Even if the country has been able to, for, for better and for worse, to organize so much of its institutions around the environment and, and climate change. Uh, and whatever has is left of the uh, de developmentalist state or the state that sees itself as redistributing uh, wealth is being moved away from any kind of environmental climate change orientation. Um, I'll, I'll just stop there. Yeah, go ahead, Lucas, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for that. And I'll be very brief on this point. Um, you know, in the case of the Great Plains and the American West, the story is all over the newspapers right now. Everyone knows that climate change and, you know, a mega drought and heat waves are really impacting surface water that's very visible. The impacts on groundwater and how groundwater goes with surface water uh, is less visible. The relationship between, you know, underground aquifer storage and stream flow rates and how that impacts river basins and stuff is still coming to the public consciousness. Uh, I think that's an important part of the climate change story that's going to get more attention, I hope. Um, I do think that it's important to um, to take up Andrea's prompt about scarcity and expanding a conversation uh, around scarcity and excess and making sure that we can encompass both of those poles and talk about both of those um, dynamics as mutually constitutive and also not lose sight of the fact that in some communities, like the ones I'm from, um, scarcity is still a point that uh, people are struggling to have heard. Mm -hmm. uh, people on the front lines, their voices are being silenced around questions of scarcity. Uh, and in fact, denying scarcity is a key tactic of a conservative movement and a, and a large agribusiness lobby to deny climate change, uh, to disempower certain groups of people, 
uh, and to also participate in this general strategy of deferral and delay. Uh, so I think that, you know, the politics around excess and the politics around scarcity, I think it's a really interesting question about how those are distributed, uh, how they loop back into these other structures that, that each of you have brought up in earlier parts of the conversation. And, um, you know, I think in the context of the Great Plains, the good news is that um, there's a lot of great people involved in this uh, at a community level, uh, as well as experts and scholars. Uh, and, you know, I just want to give a shout out to all the great work that's happening in Kansas uh, to try to use and recover actionable time from the kind of corporate discourses of denying scarcity. Uh, and I think that's a key front line for the, the climate justice struggle right now. So with that, I'll pass it to Myra. Um, okay, so I, I mean, I won't belabor this point because I think I, you know, brought it up earlier, but one, one point, of course, to respond would be um, that there's this, the increasing invocation of the need to build, you know, more storage for impending scarcity. So even when um, a flood with, uh, you know, of as devastating proportions as, as, as the ones just five months ago happened, very quickly and strikingly, um, it, from, from many um, uh, you know, fronts of official powerful discourse, the question still became, or the you know, conversation still became, well, if we'd had better storage, we could have, right? And so, so those are very, very vibrant, ongoing uh, you know, um, conversations. And, and also, I guess, just, just to point that this is a very fractured discourse, right? There's, it's, and it's fractured along multiple lines, right? Provincial, international environmental activists versus water bureaucrats and also like Andrea was mentioning earlier not all water bureaucrats think the same right that it, it's not just one like uh, you know category in a more everyday sense of water usage um I think tracking patterns of land use and changing tenurial um uh land tenure regimes is going to be uh, you know one way it's, it's it's certainly something that i'm interested in and i'm currently you know trying to do for example do higher temperatures translate into crop yield decline which they are projected uh, you know to do and or crop failures how soon will these effects materialize how widespread will they be how dramatic will they be and relatedly how they're being interpreted by those who work most closely with um you know the land and I think that here there's, there's, there's an interesting um, a point of differentiation, because if you look at a lot of the development discourse around this, it's, it's very much like we have to educate the farmer, we have to educate them and tell them that climate change is going to hit them, right? But, I mean, these are people who work with the land, with the water, they know, right? They, they are, how, but how are they interpreting, um, how, how are they experiencing um, changes and, you know, um, trends? Um, and so I guess the you know, overall question then for me becomes um, what are the ways in which, um, in which everyday translations of climate change happen to, for, and by those who work you know, with the land and the water? And then um, where I've worked uh, mostly so far, Northern Punjab, these sorts of cropping concerns and fluctuating water availability, right, these, these tend to be, in my assessment, in my reading, these tend to be among the key concerns. But as we saw with the floods a few months ago in the northern and northwestern areas, flash floods will be and have already become key, um, very frequent, actually, disturbingly frequent, you know, manifestations. Increasingly, Pakistan is seeing, uh, for example, this phenomenon of glacier lake outburst floods. Cities are affected in very particular ways, given how drainage has been built over time, ignored rather. And more generally, projections of decreasing water availability um, are on the rise. And I think this circles back um, to, the, to the question that Andrea, uh, you know, was raising about, about scarcity and excess and also um, what Lucas said, said, said on this. I think it's one of the challenges here, at least in this setting, is that, it, that we're not talking about a steady decline. And so, you know, the path to decline, unfortunately, is a path marked by devastating, you know, deluge. So, so basically, it's, it's, it's variability. And that puts this whole distributive irrigation system that's built on and operated according to calculating and estimating averages and expected flows under immense strain. Right? Um, so what will this mean for an agriculture dependent economy and associated politics? How will people, how will varied interests participate in and thus you know, mold this politics? And two remaining points very quickly, um, but if there's no time, 
uh, you know, feel free to shut me up. But 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 I think I I think this is important because there's there's something here about 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 the nature of everyday geopolitics, um, which at least in my setting, you know, continues to be um, continues to be very very important. So in the case of India and Pakistan, I think what's also concerning is how governmental elites cite climate change towards ends that can um, and that do threaten to exacerbate hostility and worsen international um, you know, relations. Consider, for example, if you, you know, just look at this one, um, for example, component of, of flood water data sharing regime between India and Pakistan. So in 1989, the Indian and Pakistani commissioners for Indus Waters reached an agreement on an arrangement for the communication of flood flows information from July 1 to October 10 every year. This period, this time period every year is known as, it's, it's officially flood season, right? So in addition to broadcasting meteorological and flood data and priority flood telegrams, it was decided that India would communicate flood data for <clears throat> each river differently. So I'm talking you know, specifically about the Ravi. The River Ravi to Pakistan on the telephone at six hour intervals for discharges between 30,000 and 100,000 QSETs at three hour intervals for higher discharges, and I won't bore you with details, and hourly um, telephone calls for even higher discharges. The system works well from 1989, and then this data sharing was discontinued in 2017. And since 2017, India has only been sharing data for what are called extraordinary flows, so much higher uh, you know, excess flows. So I think it's a very real way in which domestic national politics manifest geopolitically and how and what that means for how much water is going to flow where. You know, when. I have a concluding point um, very quickly also, um, which is that I'm, I'm also very interested in uh, based, based on the you know, um, points that, 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 that have already been raised in tracking and understanding these, resp these responses relationally. Right? So for example, our floods being defended against in a similar fashion in say New York City, Karachi, the Bay Area, right? Like where does, where does this widespread faith in stronger, higher, better embankments, you know, come from? What travels of expertise and capital undergird this uniformity in approach and response? And of course we can disagree. We can say that, you know, there is, there is no uniformity, but where, for example, are the managed retreat conversations picking up? Um, and why are they not picking up in, you know, um, some other places? What are these reasons of political economy? history, export, as well as you know, lay politics. Um, with that, I'll, I'll hand it back. Um, I'll hand it back to Andrew. Thank you. Thank you, Myra. And thank you all for your responses. Um, incredibly illuminating to hear about different perspectives from different, you know, different places in the world, thinking about, right, the place-based nature also of materiality that Andrea pointed us to. Um, so th at this point in the in in, in the webinar, um, I'm going to open it up to questions from the audience, um, and and I guess the first question that I'll ask um, that's come in um, is is really just thinking about cor corporations and privatization, right? And there's a question about um, increasing corporate privatization and whether or not that actually is linked to you know, the simultaneous increase of things like pollution and toxic pollutants and, and aquifers. And so the question is just simply to the group, is it accurate to say that the pace of, of both uh, is rapidly increasing um, as fast as the water tables are dropping? So it's really a question about the relationship, I think, between privatization and pollution in terms of, in terms of water sources. And you know, if you could just speak to your own areas of expertise here, obviously. Um, is there anyone who wanted to start with that? I'm happy to start um, and you know speak very very quickly to this. Is it? Um, and this also ties in with um, a, a you know kind of a question that that Lucas's work raises um, for us, and you know, especially I think for me, given given the context that I'm trying to understand. Um, is uh, so the you know like for example this distinction between family farms and then uh, you know corporate agribusiness right but then what happens to or how do we think through um, the politics of increasing scarcity or depletion when this kind of distinction doesn't really hold when for example it's just that the scale is so large. It's it's mostly small farmers, but the population is so large, um, right? Where but 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 the effect we're getting, we're still you know pumping our way 
um, to the same, uh, you know, um, conclusion. So, so, so I, you know, that's one question and I will end uh, to respond to uh, the question that's been asked is by giving you a small um, example. So this happened recently in Pakistan a few years ago, I think three years ago, where um, the, one of the higher courts decided that groundwater extraction had to be taxed. Uh, you know, again, this sort of uh, growing discourse of water scarcity, what are we doing? How are we looking after our water resources? We have to tax uh, groundwater use uh, higher. And then these, you know, um, companies are summoned to court. And at some point, basically these big companies, um, you know, including Nestle, Pepsi and all, were like, uh, if this goes through, we are basically closing shop and, you know, leaving. And so that conversation stalled. And it's also led to, and, and you know, and it, it sort of opened the conversation onto, but, but who is who is more to blame, right? Like the people or the cities that are using this water or just these, you know, bottled water corporations that use only a minuscule proportion. So it's this um, interesting, I think, politics of accountability um, at play here. And I'm, I'm going to, you know, feed to, uh, to Lucas and, and Thank you, Mara. Um, Lucas, can I can I put you on the spot to answer that question? <laughs> yeah, no, I appreciate it. I think it's really great. Um, you know, I think that. Sorry, there's a there's a noise here in my background. Um, I really appreciate Myra's um, prompt. You know, I think that what we're all getting to with all of these answers around this question is that abstractions are maybe. Um, a problem in many cases uh, and searching for a too easy generalized pattern uh, can often pull us right away from the really fine grained details of the things that we're interested in and that you can really build an alliance around. Uh, and I definitely think that's true if you're talking about privatization and toxicity in on the Great Plains that operates in a very particular formation. Uh, and that has to do with all of these other tensions of materiality that were brought up around the depth of, of groundwater supplies, how they interact with surface. You know, there's some places where there's a toxicity that's a very fluid, dynamic relationship. And there's other places where people kind of get off the hook uh, because of the depths of the groundwater uh, and the insulating factors around it, even though the resource is highly privatized and has been uh, from the beginning of settler colonialism in the area. And so, you have just a, such a, an immense formation of things um, that I, I really appreciate the opportunity to bring them into conversation. I'll pass that on to Andrea with that. I will just reinforce uh, what Lucas and, and Myra ha have just said, and I'll give you two examples uh, to make it concrete. Maybe I'll focus on the on the pollution and toxicity part. Uh, so one uh, in Costa Rica, uh, you don't you don't have water rights, and you don't wa water is not private property. So as in most parts around the world, water is owned by the state, um, owned uh, by the state, and you must get a license or some sort of a permit to to extract water. So that's the the broader context. Two examples: Costa Rica has in the in the last uh, ten years become the largest exporter of pineapple in the world, uh, this place in Hawaii, uh, and uh, one of the chemicals that is used in the production of pineapple has been found in a number of uh, groundwater sources for many of these community aqueducts that I was uh, I was um, mentioning. So in this case. It, what is at stake is not the privatization of water at all. Uh, it's other sorts of economic processes that are, in fact, privatizing the water, right? In the sense that this, this side product of the wealth that these farmers are generating uh, through the export of, of uh, pineapple uh, is the destruction of the aquifers. Uh, you know, we, in, in economic terms, you talk about those as externalities, et cetera. Another example is uh, just infrastructural accidents. Uh, for instance, uh, in, the, in the central part of the country, in the capital where most of the population lives, there was an accident, this was many years ago, a gas station couldn't account for, if I remember incorrectly, 30,000 liters 
of, of petrochemicals from one measurement to the next. What had happened, there had been a leak and that went into the aquifer. Um, so again, just a reminder that in many cases, as Lucas was pointing, what is at stake is water itself as an object, as X liters of water per second that can be appropriated for a particular economic pro uh, process. But many times what is at stake is this nebulous formation that is not turned into an object but becomes harmed through other activities that in theory are, direct, are not directly connected to the appropriation of water itself. And then just a gesture towards the robust literature on the effects of privatization that has been produced mm -hmm. since the 90s around this question. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so we, we have another question that um, you know, I think Lucas is mostly directed at, 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 at your expertise in terms of working on the on, you know, in, in the US and on the plains from a um, from an audience member who's asked about um, sustainable agriculture in the US and what are some solutions for more sustainable agriculture. And I guess the question is, you know, it, it, I mean, the, the prompt is, is suggesting that um, the agricultural sector seems to be overlooked in a lot of the clean energy politics in the US. And so I guess the question is simply, um, you know, is that something that that is talked about in your field work? Um, and the ways in which, you know, how, how do you think of, how do we think about sustainable agriculture in the case of the aquifer, for instance, and what are some solutions? And, you know, is, is, are the politics um, as robust, I guess, as, as what the, they could be? Yeah, thank you so much. And thank you to the audience member who asked the question. I really appreciate it. Um, I'll try to keep this short. There's a lot there. Uh, and there's there's like so many important parts of that question that could be unpacked uh, and broken down into certain elements and brought back to local communities and grounded and placed um, dilemmas that are ongoing. But first of all, you know, I think that sustainable agriculture is on the table in a lot of Great Plains, Oglala aquifer states. I think that how that happens is really interesting. Uh, what part of that conversation is visible to who and how becomes like um, the salient point to really note there. There's a lot of community-based initiatives to try to find different ways. Um, and I think that uh, we shouldn't overlook that. I think that there's a momentum to overlook that that's fomented by corporate agribusiness lobbies, uh, which want to convince us all it's again around this kind of myth of the farmer and what that is to convince us that any critique of corporate agribusiness is actually a critique of our community values. And it isn't that's a that's a, a falsehood that a lot of different political instrumentalities come through uh, as this this person probably knows if you're from the Great Plains. Um, our Plains communities are extremely diverse. Uh, the, this kind of like imaginary that people use um, really doesn't hold true. And that's, that's definitely true for sustainable agriculture. So I think that sustainable agriculture is on the table. I think a lot of people are talking about it. I think the way that those conversations get translated into policy uh, is, the, is the question. Uh, and I think that we could do a huge amount. There's a lot of work on this. Uh, in rural sociology and agrarian studies, people have written a lot about the ways in which you could use farm finance programs uh, to ease a transition to sustainable agriculture in a way. Uh, and people have gone, have detailed a lot of different pathways forward. And whoever it is that wrote that question, um, please feel free to email me and I'm happy to continue that conversation uh, in the future. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lucas. And I'm I'm looking at the clock here. And actually, unfortunately, it looks like we are already out of time. Um, this conversation is, has gone really quickly. Um, thank you all to the panelists and thanks to the audience for being here um, and participating and, and to listening. So just uh, finally, a, a warm thank you to Andrea um, Ballestero, um, Lucas Basir, and uh, Myra Hyatt for being here and for a really stimulating conversation about water, um, its materiality, the place-based nature of it, its politics, techno-politics, and the various ways we come to know it 
and how knowing it itself, right, we might think about different kinds and modalities of politics around those as well. So thank you all. Um, and thank you, uh, Jisha, for the invitation to, to be here and to, to moderate this discussion. Okay. I think with that, we just say goodbye and wave. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.